Good evening, everyone. My name's uh, Alex, uh, and I've been asked to talk about specifically the new treatments for hepatitis C. Um, so it's a very exciting time. Uh, I think this, I'm obviously uh, a little biased, but I think this is one of the most exciting developments in, in medicine. It's certainly one of the biggest changes um, that I've observed in medicine um, in my sort of 25 to 30 years uh, in the field so far. Um, I'd like to start with my acknowledgement to country disclosures. I have been involved in clinical trials that evaluated the development um, of the new treatments for hepatitis C, so I do have disclosures. Um, we haven't got a printout of my talk, but uh, one uh, terrific initiative that has been developed over the last six months is an Australian consensus statement about the treatment of hepatitis C. This was developed by the Gastroenterology Society in partnership with ASHAM, ACID, the College of General Practitioners, uh, the Australasian Hepatology Association as well as Hepatitis Australia. And it's been developed specifically to help um, primary care doctors, general practitioners who are new to the area to have an accessible guidelines for using these new drugs for assessing and treating hepatitis C. It's available online. Um, if you go to um, the gastroenterology website, uh, which is www.geza.org.au, um, it's um, available as a PDF that you can download or print out. Um, there will be a summary of this statement published in the MJA, MJA next month. Um, so those of you who, are, um, uh, who receive the MJA will receive a summary statement of this. Um, it also there's also on the website uh, a two-page summary cheat sheet for assessing and for treating hepatitis C. Um, so this is the evolution of hepatitis C. In the space of 25 years, we've gone from the identification, um, uh, the first identification of the virus, to being able to cure almost every patient with hepatitis C, which which I said, as I say, is a pretty dramatic um, progression. Um, you'll all be familiar with the treatment uh, up until last year that involved interferon. Um, you can see that there was a stepwise progression in the different interferon-based strategies from a 6% cure rate um, in the early days, back in the early 90s, through to 70% overall cure rates um, up until last year with the use of the first direct-acting antivirals that were used in combination with peak interferon and ribavirin. And now we have um, interferon-free regimens licensed for all patients with genotype 1, 2 and 3 hepatitis C, which is roughly 90% of hepatitis C in Australia, um, that have cure rates of 95% plus for most patients. Um, so this, this is a complicated cartoon, but it just summarises the life cycle of hepatitis C. Um, and what, what it really focuses on is that there are a number of steps in the life cycle of hepatitis B that can be targeted with direct-acting antiviral agents, which is what's led to the development of these combination regimens. So key steps uh, um, in the life cycle are the NS3 uh, protease, which chops up the virus into the different um, machineries um, that are used for replication, and there are protease inhibitors that target specifically <coughs> the NS3 protease. Um, there's the NS5B polymerase, so this is what um, is responsible for reverse replication and the replication itself. Um, there are nucleotide as well as non-nucleotide inhibitors of the NS5B polymerase. Uh, and then there are NS5A inhibitors, um, and it's combinations of two or three drugs from these classes that are used in the, the treatment regimens that are now available. Um, so Joe's already put up this slide, a slightly different <laughs> colour scheme, but most hepatitis C in Australia is genotype 1. Um, Genotype 1A, um, which is relevant to, to particularly one of the treatment regimens, is about two-thirds of hepatitis C, um, and genotype 1B is about one-third. Um, the cell culture models that have been used to develop these drugs use a genotype 1B background, so genotype 1B is the easiest to cure. Genotype 1A is almost as easy to cure. Um, and then uh, genotype 3 is about 35 to 40 percent of hepatitis C in Australia. Um, it's, it's more common in people who inject drugs, so in particularly um, People who've recently injected drugs, there is a higher percentage of genotype 3 and probably just over half of that population have genotype 3 infection. Then about 5% of our hepatitis C is genotype 2 and then the small numbers of genotype 4, hepatitis C particularly in people of Egyptian background, and then genotype 6 hepatitis C particularly in people of Vietnamese background. Um, these are the DAAs that are now approved in Australia. Um, so uh, at the top of the slide are interferon containing regimens. So for a small number of people, the treatment, the approved treatment is still interferon based and that's for people with genotypes 4, 5 and 6 hepatitis C. So less than 5% of the patient pool. 
But for those patients, that they still require um, interferon-based treatment. That will change in about 12 months. The next round of, um, uh, of drugs that are coming through are active against Gentype 4 and Gentype 6. Um, at the bottom, we have the different regimens that are interferon-free. Um, and so here there are, there's the combination of an NS5 inhibitor, 5A inhibitor with a nuke or an NS5B inhibitor. And there's two regimens that are, that are licensed in Australia. Um, uh, Lidipazvir, which is LDV plus sofosbuvir, um, licensed for the treatment of genotype 1, uh, and Decladazvir plus sofosbuvir, licensed for the, uh, the treatment of genotype 1 and genotype 3. Um, the, uh, the four drug um, combination, which is uh, um, a drug regimen um, uh, made by the company Abbey, and it's colloquially known as the 3D regimen because there are three different direct acting antivirals, um, is licensed for gen. Well, it, it's TGA uh, approved, it will be PBS licensed as of May the 1st for the treatment of genotype 1. And then the combination of a nuke plus ribavirin is also licensed for genotype 2 as well as genotype 3. Um, this is taken from the consensus statement, the national consensus statement, and just summarises the different regimens um, uh, for the treatment on this slide of genotype 1. And you can see that the treatment regimens do differ according to whether a person has cirrhosis or doesn't have cirrhosis. Um, and in some instances do differ according to whether the person is treatment naive or has previously been treated for hepatitis C. I don't think you need to um, remember the specifics, you just need to know that there are differences and to have the reference guide to look back at. Um, for uh, primary care based treatment, we recommend that that's for people with no cirrhosis. And for most people with no cirrhosis, treatment duration is 12 weeks. So remember 12 weeks of treatment duration um, if you want to remember a duration. Uh, the regimens approved for genotype 1 are sofosbuvir plus lidipazvir, and this will be the most common regimen used. Um, uh, it's uh, effective against both genotype 1A and genotype 1B. Sofosbuvir plus decladazvir um, plus or minus ribavirin is also uh, approved for genotype 1. It requires two different prescriptions um, and two different tablets, whereas sofosbuvir plus lidipazvir is co-formulated as a single pill. And then the third regimen um, that uh, is about to be PBS listed is the 3D regimen, which is a combination of paratapravir, ombidazvir um, and dasabuvir. A protease inhibitor, an NS5A inhibitor, and an NS5B inhibitor. Um, the, this regimen differs uh, according to whether a patient has genotype 1A or genotype 1B infection, and with genotype 1A infection, patients do still need ribavirin, which is associated with some, some side effects. Um, for uh, genotypes 2 to 6, these are the licensed treatment regimens. So for genotype 2, it's sofosbuvir plus ribavirin for 12 weeks. Genotype 3, um, the preferred regimen, there are three different regimens licensed for genotype 3. The preferred regimen for people with no cirrhosis is the combination of sofosbuvir plus decladazvir, which is a 12-week regimen. But sofosbuvir plus ribavirin is also approved. Uh, it requires 24 weeks of treatment. Um, uh, and then there is still into the combination of sofosbuvir plus interferon plus ribavirin, um, which is licensed for genotype 3 as well as genotypes 4, 5 and 6. We will use that for a very, very small number of genotype 3 patients, and probably only as a salvage treatment regimen in people who fail a first-line DEA regimen. I'm just going to go through a little bit of the clinical trial data um, before finishing with just a summary of the nuts and bolts of, of what you should do when uh, you're working a patient up for treatment. And these slides are all a little bit boring. Um, but uh, sofosbuvir plus lidipazvir, this is the combination of sofosbuvir and NS5B um, inhibitor. It's the only direct nucleotide inhibitor that's available at the moment for the treatment of hepatitis C, and it's really the backbone of most treatments. Um, uh, Harvoni is the combination of sofosbuvir plus lidipazvir, which is an NS5A inhibitor. Um, and uh, this, these two pills have been co-formulated, so it's a one pill, once a day medication. Um, and it uh, was released, uh, on, it was made available on the PBS on March the 1st. Uh, the, this is the phase three, these are the two phase three trials in treatment naive people that evaluated um, this combination. And these studies looked at in ion 1, uh, the combination of sofosbuvir plus lidipazvir for 12 or 24 weeks, plus or minus ribavirin. Um, and then in people with no cirrhosis, uh, there was a second study, ion 3, that looked at eight weeks treatment duration versus 12 weeks treatment duration, um, plus or minus ribavirin. So ion 1, um, you can see that the SVR12 rates, and, and sorry, I should say SVR12 is what we now refer to as a cure. So the cure rates in this study were um, 97 to 99%. Um, in every treatment arm, so clearly 12 weeks of treatment with no ribavirin is enough for, um, for genotype 1 patients. 
20% of people in this study were, had cirrhosis and there was no difference in the response rates according to whether cirrhosis was present or not. So that's just summarised in this slide. You can see that the, the um, cure rates were similar in people with cirrhosis and no cirrhosis. ION3 was the study that looked at shorter treatment duration. Um, and in this study, uh, look, using eight weeks of um, uh, osmovir plus lidipasvir, very high cure rates, um, regardless of whether ribavirin was used or not, um, and similar to the 12-week treatment regimen. Um, a subsequent sub-analysis of this study um, identified that it was patients with low vi lower viral load who were, um, who were the subpopulation who were really had exactly the same treatment uh, success rate with eight weeks versus 12 weeks. And so this is in the label for people who are treatment naive who don't have cirrhosis. If you want to use eight weeks of treatment, um, a viral load of less than six million identifies those patients who can be treated for only eight weeks. I should say that most of us would, uh, un unless a patient, uh, you have particular concerns about a patient um, benefiting from short duration treatment, it's probably better just to treat for 12 weeks and um, absolutely maximise the, the cure rate. Um, uh, a similar study looked at uh, treatment experience patients. So this will, uh, I suspect, only be a very small minority of patients that you would be seeing, but these are patients who've previously been treated with interferon. Uh, they had the same approach, 12 versus 24 weeks of treatment, plus or minus ribavirin. Again, very high cure rates um, with 12 or 24 weeks of treatment. Um, uh, there was a cirrhosis signal. So in the, these are harder to cure patients, so they've previously been treated with interferon and they've failed interferon. Um, uh, and in patients who are cirrhosis, there is a, who have a history of cirrhosis, there is a lower success rate. Um, and, and so for this population who are cirrhotic and treatment experienced, we'd recommend 24 weeks of treatment. Um, this treatment regimen is very well tolerated. Um, so at the side effects reported in the study, there were um, uh, infrequent tiredness and headache, as well as some insomnia. Um, uh, but particularly compared to interferon, um, this is really a very benign treatment. Um, there is the potential for drug-drug interactions with all antivirals for hepatitis C. Um, so with this particular uh, treatment regimen, it's not recommended that patients should be on resuvastatin. Um, there is a, a proton pump inhibitor effect, uh, and this is because lidipasvir, which is the NS5A inhibitor, its absorption is dependent on gastric acidity, and if you're taking high doses of, um, of a proton pump inhibitor, there's less lidipasvir absorbed, and, and there is some uh, evidence that the treatment's a bit less effective in that setting. Um, amiodarone is contraindicated with this, uh, this treatment combination, and there have been reports of complete heart block and one or two deaths. Um, but that, that's one or two deaths in over 100,000 people who've now been treated with uh, this combination and only in people who are using amiodarone in combination with um, sofosbuvir plus a second DAA. So you shouldn't use amiodarone with this uh, drug, but otherwise it, it's a very safe regimen. Um, shouldn't be used in combination with rifampicin. Uh, uh, patients are often taking St John's wort. They shouldn't use it. Uh, they shouldn't use St John's wort while they're having treatment with this regimen. But there's no significant interactions with the contraceptive pill, with most HIV antiretrovirals, with simple antacids, with opiates. So for patients on opiate substitution therapy, this is a suitable regimen. Um, and there's no significant drug-drug interaction with most immunosuppressive agents, which is relevant to the post-transplant setting. There's a fantastic um, website called the University of Liverpool website. And anyone who's um, been actively treating HIV will be familiar with this website. It's, um, uh, it's a free uh, website resource provided by the University of Liverpool in England. Um, there's a, a free app that you can download onto your smartphone that doesn't contain every drug, but it contains most drugs as well as all the hepatitis C antivirals. Uh, and so this is the label for, um, for Harvoni or Sofosbuvir plus Lidibusvir in Australia. Um, so genotype 1A and 1B, uh, 12 weeks for all uh, no, patients with no cirrhosis and you can consider shorter duration treatment um, in treatment naive people with a low viral load. Um, 12 weeks for patients with cirrhosis and then patients with cirrhosis who previously failed interferon, that's 24 weeks of treatment. Um, the only other thing to say about uh, sofosbuvir in particular is that it's renally excreted, as, as are most nucleotide inhibitors, uh, and so it's not recommended in people who have significant renal impairment, and that significant renal impairment being an EGFR of less than 30. 
Um, the second uh, treatment regimen that will be used for genotype 1 hepatitis C is a drug combination called Vicuripac. So this is a combination of paratapravir, which is a protease inhibitor, and it is a ritonavir-boosted protease inhibitor, so this has implications for drug-drug interactions. Um, on bitasvir, an NS5A inhibitor, and desabuvir, which is an uh, NS5B polymerase inhibitor. So this uh, is not a one pill once a day regimen. Um, it's uh, one pill uh, twice a day, uh, and one uh, and then one pill, well, then two doses of one pill in the morning. Um, and then for patients with gen type one A, it involves ribavirin. And this is a complicated slide. Might skip through, but uh, again, it's twelve weeks of treatment for most patients, and the cure rates are ninety five percent and above. Um, the key with using this regimen is that for genotype 1A patients, ribavirin is required, which, and the reality is that the requirement for ribavirin means that we won't use this regimen for genotype 1A because, because it's an alternative that doesn't involve ribavirin. Ribavirin causes fatigue, it causes anemia, and it's teratogenic. So if you had a treatment regimen that was similarly effective, you wouldn't use the ribavirin regimen. And, and, and so this regimen won't be um, very popular for genotype 1A, but it is a good treatment regimen for genotype 1B with cure rates of 98 to 100 per cent in all the clinical trials. So in genotype 1B, you can see here that uh, this is a, a randomised study that compared the regimen with and without ribavirin for genotype 1B. You can see that there's, uh, there's really no difference at all in the cure rates, 99.5 per cent versus 99 per cent. So you don't need ribavirin with genotype 1B. Um, I will through to um, the side effects. Uh, so this regimen probably has slightly more side effects. It, it's a, it's a well-tolerated regimen, but um, just has a few more side effects than, um, than sofosbuvir plus ledipasvir. Um, so this, uh, the combination used in this drug is do uh, inhibit some of the biliary transporters. So it's quite common to see a slight rise in bilirubin early in treatment. Um, so a bilirubin of twice normal was seen in 15% of patients who had the regimen with ribavirin um, and a smaller percentage of patients who had the, took the regimen without ribavirin. Um, there is anemia observed with this regimen, but really that's related to the use of ribavirin. So in the, um, if the regimen's used without ribavirin for genotype 1B, anemia is uncommon. Um, there is uh, a very, very rare ALT elevation seen, or seen in 1% of patients. More common uh, in women who are taking um, ethanol estradiol, and so this ethanol estradiol um, contraceptive should not be used um, when treating with this regimen. Um, the other um, the, the other issue with this regimen is that it's not suitable for people with very advanced liver disease because there's a pro because it involves a protease inhibitor. These are all cleared by the liver, and in people whose livers don't work well, you get very high levels of drug, and it can um, it can uh, cause liver toxicity but that's really only in people with advanced cirrhosis or decompensated cirrhosis. So, so shouldn't be people that you'll be seeing in your clinics. Drug-drug um, uh, interactions are an issue for all drugs. <coughs> They're a little more of an issue for this uh, regimen because there are three drugs and then there's also uh, ritonavir. Um, there's a long list of drug interactions uh, and it's important to check uh, the University of Liverpool website be before starting anyone on treatment. Uh, so this is the Australian label for uh, the AbbVie regimen, the 3D regimen. So for genotype 1A, it's uh, 12 weeks plus ribavirin, and the ribavirin, as I said, is an issue with, with some toxicity. But for genotype 1B, um, whilst the label involves ribavirin, clearly the data now suggests, and it's data sort of subsequent to the label they applied for, the data suggests that you don't need ribavirin. So the recommended treatment regimen in the consensus statement is 12 weeks no ribavirin. Um, and for these patients, it's a very effective regimen. What about genotype 3? Well, as discussed, there are three different regimens that are, um, that are approved for genotype 3. Um, this slide summarises uh, the three different clinical trials. So starting at the bottom, sofosbuvir plus decladesvir, which would be our preferred regimen for patients with no cirrhosis in genotype 3, a 12-week regimen. Um, then, uh, then there's uh, the study that evaluated triple therapy with sofosbuvir plus pegylated interferon and ribavirin. And then there's the combination of sofosbuvir plus ribavirin. And all of these regimens are now approved in Australia. So firstly, the combination of sofosbuvir plus decladesvir. Uh, so this study uh, was a single arm study. Um, and the overall cure rates were 96% for genotype 3 patients, 12 weeks of treatment. But what was observed here was that the, the cure rates are very good in people with no cirrhosis, so this is the dark purple bars. 
But in people with cirrhosis, 12 weeks of sphospophere plus declatosphere is suboptimal, and you can see that there's a significant difference in the cure rates in people with cirrhosis versus no cirrhosis. So in treatment naive people with no cirrhosis, the cure rates are 97%, uh, whereas in people with cirrhosis, cure rates are 58%. So subsequent data um, uh, using, the, using the two different approaches to prolong treatment from 12 to 24 weeks or to uh, plus or minus ribavirin has shown that uh, doubling the treatment duration from 12 to 24 weeks is associated with a significant step up in cure rates in people with cirrhosis. So you can see that the combination of sphosphavir plus declatosvir in the setting of cirrhosis has an 86% cure rate. So this is, this is getting to the 90% plus threshold that we really expect now with treatment of hepatitis C. Um, uh, Sphosphivir plus ribavirin for 24 weeks. Uh, this, is, this is a good treatment, works well for non-cirrhotic people, but it's 24 weeks of treatment versus 12 weeks of treatment. So we would expect similar cure rates with this combination for 24 weeks compared to sphosphivir plus declatosvir for 12 weeks. I think most patients would prefer three months of treatment versus six months of treatment. Um, it's less effective for people who are cirrhotic, uh, particularly if they're treatment experienced. Um, and so this is where, as Joe was alluding to earlier, the treatment experience cirrhotic genotype 3 patients are now the hardest to cure group where um, uh, 60 to 70% uh, cure rates uh, are the, um, the, the highest response rates we see with, um, with this regimen. Um, what about sphosphavir plus peg interferon plus ribavirin? Well, the only reason this regimen uh, is approved is because it's a 12-week regimen and it, it works well. So despite the toxicity, it does work well. So you can see in this hardest to cure group of um, treatment experience cirrhotics, in this study, the highest, um, which randomised sphosphavir plus ribavirin for 24 weeks versus the triple therapy regimen for 12 weeks, the best results were seen with interferon. So we won't use this as first-line treatment. We'll use sphosphavir plus declatosvir, but in people who fail sphosphavir plus declatosvir, this, this does provide a, a salvage treatment option. Um, despite the side effects of interferon treatment, only one, there was only a 1% dropout in the, in the interferon-based treatment arm in this study. So whilst interferon has side effects, most people can tolerate three months of interferon. So again, there are three different regimens um, for the treatment of genotype 3. Sphosphavir plus declatosvir for 12 weeks for no cirrhosis or 24 weeks in people with cirrhosis um, is the preferred first-line treatment regimen. So the combination of sphosphavir plus ribavirin is also available, but it's a 24 treatment regimen for, uh, for everyone, for all patients. Um, and then sphosphavir plus peak interferon and ribavirin is also available. It's a 12 week treatment regimen, but it has interferon associated side effects. And so it will be a second line or a salvage treatment regimen. Uh, lastly, genotype 2. Um, uh, so the, the Preferred treatment regimen for genotype 2 hepatitis C is 12 weeks, and this is enough for most patients. So cure rates of 90 to 95% in all patient groups with 12 weeks of treatment. So that's the, uh, that's the Australian label, 12 weeks, phosphobia plus ribavirin. So to summarise, um, these, uh, so these summarise the cure rates for the different treatment regimens um, in people with no cirrhosis. So we have lidipasvir plus fosbuvir. We have the ABV 3D regimen for genotype 1A that involves ribavirin and for genotype 1B. And you can see that across the board for genotype 1 in people with no cirrhosis, we should be curing 95% plus of patients. Genotype 3 in treatment naive populations, um, uh, sorry, in, in uh, people with no cirrhosis, with fosbuvir plus declatosvir, we should be curing 95% of people. And in genotype 2, with just 12 weeks of sphosphivir plus ribavirin, 91 to 97% cure rates. Um, this is the PBS uh, indication for prescription. So patients must be aged, so at the moment treatment's for adults only. Patients must be 18 years or older. Um, patients must be treated by a gastroenterologist, hepatologist or infectious diseases physician with experience in treating hepatitis C or by another doctor in consultation with a gastroenterologist, hepatologist or infectious disease physician. Um, and the minimum information required are the hepatitis C genotype, the patient's cirrhosis status, um, uh, and then it's required to be documented in the patient's uh, medical records that there's evidence of chronic hepatitis C infection, which is interpreted really as just repeated HCV RNA positivity. Uh, and it's important to document the uh, hepatitis C genotype in the patient's uh, treatment record. So a very bare bones patient workup. 
Um, I think this is the absolute minimum. When you go through the consensus statement, there is more detail about the various different steps, but this is the absolute minimum that's required. Hepatitis C genotype. Hepatitis C viral load, if you're thinking about um, short duration treatment in people with no cirrhosis. Must do a cirrhosis assessment, and Joe's already nicely gone through how that can be done. There are clinical markers. Fibroscan is the preferred modality, but if it's gonna take, if there's gonna be some delay to accessing um, uh, Fibroscan, then there are other um, modalities that, that can be used, such as APRI, which is a, a um, serum marker based on serum AST as well as platelet count, so it's free and it's available to everyone. It's very important that the cirrhosis assessment is done before treatment, so, so it's, the, it's not the right thing to do to start someone on treatment, book their Fibroscan at the same time and get that done after treatment, because you can miss cirrhosis if you do that. Um, so the cirrhosis assessment needs to be done before treatment. Um, because the phosphobia is renally excreted, you need to check the EGFR just to make sure that the EGFR is greater than 30 if you're planning phosphobia. And then before starting any uh, personal treatment, it's important to check for drug-drug interactions. Uh, and we've, it's fortunate that we have the University of Liverpool website um, that can guide us in that, uh, in that assessment. So this is the, this is the cheat sheet um, from the uh, consensus statement. Um, uh, and I was just wanting to highlight that we'd recommend that it's people with no cirrhosis that should be treated in the community, and we'd still recommend that people with cirrhosis be referred uh, to the specialist centres for management of the hepatitis C as well as management of their liver disease. Um, if the fibrous <coughs> is greater than 12.5, then the patient should be managed as if they have cirrhosis. <laughs> the R-PRE score, um, and this is a, there's a mathematical formula, but there is a, a website, again, that can do it for you as long as you have the AST, you know what the upper limit of normal in your laboratory is, and you know what the platelet count is, and the key threshold is an R-PRE of one. So an R-PRE of less than one patient doesn't have cirrhosis, um, and, uh, and you can treat them as though they don't have cirrhosis. This in consultation, I'm sure this will come up in the question and answer um, session, but it's, it's still evolving, I guess, how this in consultation process should work. How we want it to work at St Vincent's is that we've, um, the ALA have developed a consultation um, two-page pro forma, uh, and what we'd like uh, people we're working with to do is to complete this pro forma, fax it to us, and we'll commit within a, a week's period to responding to that request for consultation with just an approval that, um, uh, that we agree that the, uh, the assessment indicates that the treatment regimen is appropriate and you should go ahead. Um, I think this will be a better system than phone calls and emails that, um, that may be missed or may, may take a while to respond to. So to conclude, um, hepatitis C infection is now curable and the cure is associated with improvement in quality of life, loss of infectivity and prevention of transmission, as well as regression of cirrhosis, low risk of liver failure and liver cancer and reduction in mortality. And so every Australian now who's living with hepatitis C, hepatitis C should be considered for treatment. Um, and then one final plug for the, the consensus statement. Um, and this is, a, this is the two-page cheat sheet that can be downloaded from the website that, um, that takes you through the assessment of patients as well as the on-treatment monitoring and post-treatment follow-up and then a summary of the different, different treatment regimens, um, what regimen is used for which genotype as well as the appropriate treatment duration. Okay, thanks.